I'm Jack Patrick Lewis, state representative for the majority of South Framingham, some of North Framingham, and the entire town of Ashland. On this program, we talk with elected officials, community leaders, and area activists about the current political landscape in Framingham and the future of the town that many of us call home. On today's show, I am joined by four candidates for the Board of Selectmen, each of whom are campaigning hard for the April 4th election. First, we have the two incumbents, Cheryl Tolley Stoll and Lori Lee, who are also joined by the two challengers, Deborah Butler and Gwendolyn Holbrow. Welcome each of you to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to have you here. As I explained to you beforehand, this is not a debate, and I will do everything in my power to mediate the conversation and to be as equitable with time as possible. I'm excited to discuss the issues facing our town, and with so little time and so much to talk about, let's just jump right in. So my first question goes to you, Cheryl. You are just finishing up your first term on the Board of Selectmen. Yep. You are currently serving as the chair of the Board of Selectmen. Why should the residents of Framingham give you another chance uh, as their selectmen? Uh, I think they should give me another chance if they're pleased with what I've done. And if, if, somebody's, if they're not pleased with what I've done, they shouldn't, in all honesty. Because uh, that's what matters, is what the, what the electorate thinks, not what I think. Uh, what I would say is I believe I have done a good job representing all the people of Framingham, whether it's a homeowner or a neighborhood or a parent or even you know, the children in our schools when we do budgeting and we've been working very closely this year uh, with the school department to uh, put a joint relationship together where we're able to better um, add, uh, allocate resources and support one another as one town. Uh, one of the things that I have worked very hard to do is to bring people together. And I think that's very important in a community, that we work together. Whether we agree on everything or not, I think it, it's healthy to discuss disagreements. And I think it's also healthy to have debate over in, issues in Framingham, because everybody comes from their own personal perspective. And if we don't share it, we can't learn and be better leaders. So I, I would hope that people give me another opportunity to continue um, working and um, help, helping people in town. Thank you so much. Deborah. you uh, are a town meeting member uh, who ran last year unsuccessfully for the Board of Selectmen. And so for people watching at home, why should they give your candidacy a, a second look? Well, um, one of the reasons why I was unsuccessful was that the town manager and the, d uh, the director of uh, HR spearheaded an investigation against me that was based on a complaint that an employee of the town had alleged, uh, brought against me. And uh, I have since found out that um, the town spent $11,000 on uh, hiring an attorney who produced absolutely nothing as a result um, of that investigation. So uh, I'm go coming back for my third attempt to run for selectman on a platform that I am a uh, tax attorney. And uh, if now more than ever, my skill set is necessary in this town. Excellent. Lori? So if you are re-elected, this will be your fourth, fourth term right. on the Board of Selectmen. Right. So you've been representing us for a while. For on nine, the board. Years. nine years. And, um, so before I start, I, I have to say congratulations to you oh. because we are your first of the new show that you're starting. So um, thank you and, and good luck. And Happy to have you as my first guest. Thank you. And um, yeah, I have been honored and privileged by the residents of Framingham to be elected for three terms. And which is nine years. And um, I'm very, very grateful to the community for bringing me back. Um, I, I, it's always been my number one priority to listen to people in town and to really evaluate each situation and make my decisions based on what I think is right for the citizens and the residents. I, I believe I have a proven track record. I've, um, I've worked through the financial crisis where we had to th go through major budget cr cuts. Um, I've worked through um, reducing our health insurance split from a high 90% down to 84% and then saving $18 million over three years by having the town, working with obviously town manager and selectmen, go into the GIC and you know, changing our health insurance the way that we do it. Um, it it's a huge budget cruncher. I mean, it, it's all over the world in the country. but. Um, 
uh, you know, we've also used those funds wisely. We've had a three-year plan to keep the tax levy down under 2.5%. We've been under 1.5% for three years. We've created a large capital stabilization fund for the large projects coming up. When we had the housing crisis, I spearheaded a program, the um, National Foreclosure Program, and brought $1.5 million into Framingham neighborhoods to buy to blighted and foreclosed properties and get them back on the market. I also spearheaded for um, a good six and a half, seven years, the downtown project, which resulted in, with Karen Spilka's help, finding $9 million of federal and state funds, which we could redirect from a 126 project we weren't doing to the downtown project, which is unfolding now. Um, I, I'm proud of my efforts. I could go on and on working with Chris Walsh, opening the aqueducts for public use. We worked with MWRA and convinced them that it was time to let people have their lands. And, you know, working to protect open space all over town, listening to residents who said, hey, why don't you open Cedar Swamp for us, mm. which we went ahead and did, and they were right. So um, I, I hope people see it. And if they want me back, I, I appreciate their vote. I also think that I bring you know, teamwork and, and stability. Mm. You know, we're faced with some challenges and some possible governmental mm. changes. And I would certainly um, bring you know, my maybe quiet but stable approach to town government. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Gwen, you are a community artist and a former uh, member of town meeting. Why is this the year to jump in the selectmen's race? Well, I have been active in town politics and with the cable access station in the past and the past, last few years have been, I would say, in retirement, enjoying my life, pursuing my creative interests and my, enjoying my family. And this last election for so many of us was a wake up call. Um, the, the results shocking to many and um, I feel that my core values are threatened in a new way and I could not be on the sidelines any longer. So I am hoping to put forth a new, fresh, progressive voice for the Framingham Selectmen and in support of human rights, uh, sustainability, community justice is a very important issue for me. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And that's actually a great transition um, Transition to a question I wanted to ask each of you. Uh, the Trump administration is cracking down on uh, illegal immigration. And one of the communities I've been working with locally is the local immigrant community, which is rightfully so frightened about their own safety and what the Trump administration means for them. And I know one of the things that towns across the Commonwealth and across the country are considering is becoming a sanctuary city. And of course, that means slightly different things from town to town. Uh, but I know that locally, that's something that's being discussed a little bit more. And I'd be curious as candidates for re-election, but also for first election to the Board of Selectmen, um, your position on Framingham becoming a sanctuary town or sanctuary city, depending on how April 4th goes. Uh, Cheryl, why don't we start with you? Um, I think Framingham already has a lot of the, and in basically all of the fundamentals of a sanctuary city under most of the definitions. We already have the uh, hands-off policy of the police department. They do not question about immigration status in, in any way. Uh, we have uh, a school department that is completely non-discriminatory. I really do have a problem putting a label on it, however, because it concerns me that it will put a target not only on our back, but on the back of our immigrant community. Um, the, my anticipation will be that if the Trump administration does decide to, to move in the direction that they, they hope to move, that they will first go after those self-proclaimed self sanctuary cities. We're already providing the, the benefits. Why would we want to put a target on our back that could bring immigration services in a hostile way into our community w without notice, uh, could also cost us federal tax dollars, which will hurt everyone in the community, the immigrant population, as well as everybody else. So. While I'm very supportive of our immigrant community, I am working very closely with them on this issue because they've, they've approached me about it, and I've been upfront about it. I, I'm concerned that becoming a sanctuary city will, will cause more harm than good. The other concern is that by taking sanctuary city status, we could also put ourselves in a position where people feel they have no place else to come, and our schools are already taxed over capacity. 
our, we have no extra classroom space. We are just skating on um, ELL ratios for aides and students. And if we all of a sudden were to have a, a sudden influx, financially we couldn't do it, but logistically, not only would, would those children not get the services they need, the current children who are on our system, both immigrant and, and non-immigrant children, would also then start losing services. So my concern is that by labeling us, we actually are going to be putting a target that could actually hurt the community we want to help. Okay. So I, I would not support sanctuary city status, not at this time anyway. Why don't we continue the um, same order we did for opening statements? So Deborah, same well, question. I'm glad Cheryl went first because I do uh, think she made some very, very good points um, to in terms of uh, are we do we know what we're getting into and is this the time to do that and what are the ramifications that we should apply that to all of our decisions as a town. I, I know the uh, church that I attend, the Unitarian Church, is contemplating becoming a, um, a sanctuary church, uh, and several churches are like-minded. Uh, I, for one, I'm an accredited attorney through the VA, and I have reached out to the Immigration Court to do what several attorneys in Framingham are doing, and that is to help individuals um, as they navigate um, um, with uh, habeas corpus and, and the like. So um, I would just pretty much echo what Cheryl has just said at this point um, to making um, that decision with, uh, that's an informed decision. Laurie, do you have anything to add? Sure, well, um, I thought you were going in the order. No, but did I? Okay. I think I went. Cheryl, yes. Deborah, Laurie, yes. Is that right? Gwen. Okay. It's all right. I'll anything. mix it up next time around, okay. I so, promise. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I'm hearing from both sides, and I think that um, one of the big distinctions um, between years ago, many years ago, when we had secure communities, which was, you know, the police work with um, immigration to, to locate um, any, anyone mm -hmm. who really was a, a, had a crime, it didn't work because the commun all commu part of the communities, all the factors, immigrants and non-immigrants, need to trust the police. Um, so, and and when back then it was really all focused on illegal immigrants. I think today with the political climate, I see and I get calls. Um, people are afraid, they're frightened, but they're not just illegal immigrants. They're all immigrants. They're people who came here 30 years ago who are frightened, people who are from the seven countries that are mentioned that are terrified. So I think that you know we're, we're at a different level of fear. Um, that being said, I think Cheryl is, is right. I think that um, unfortunately most people don't understand what it means to be a sanctuary city. It, it's really a, a political statement. What it is, is really a statement that your police will do local policing and not federal policing. But what it is not, it is not a protection for any of these groups of people, of anyone, from federal laws. Any federal agent can come into your town, no matter what you call yourself, and do their job. So I think people need to understand that. And um, certainly, if, if the community wanted to have a discussion, and I think it's always healthy to bring the police in and talk about sit, being safe, you know, of, of having a political statement, it's it's for a community to decide. I, I feel like I have my own political statements, but that when you're sitting as a selectman, you have to make sure you're representing the whole community. And what I think is, is so important, um, and again, it's very difficult on a local level to have an impact, but we have to hold Congress accountable for not having comprehensive immigration reform. It is not right that this country is being ruled by edict. So Congress has to, get up and do something, so anyway. No, thank you. Go ahead. And uh, I agree that um, it is it is a huge issue right now. I'm also involved with some of the immigrant rights activists in town, and I've heard tragic stories, children crying in high school because they're American citizens, but they're afraid their parents will be taken mm -hmm. from them. And I agree that we have to ad address that and do, you know, make sure that our immigrants know their rights and that bystanders know how to intervene and help if possible. Sanctuary city as a phrase, as you say, it doesn't have a legal meaning. It's a, it's a political statement and it's generally understood to mean that local law enforcement resources will not be used to enforce federal law. And I certainly agree with that policy. And in the past, we have had that policy here in Framingham. The police chief, the previous, or the police chief who's now out on leave, I believe, has, has stated that he supports that, that, um, 
that approach, but I think we have not heard that from the current acting police chief. Yes, we have actually. Oh, we have? Oh, yes. good. I'm glad. He went on Brazilian it. radio. I worked with um, acting chief Trask uh -huh. uh, several weeks ago when this started, and we put together a statement to clarify for the immigrant oh, community. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. Exactly what the policy was, and then we also went on Brazilian radio together mm -hmm. to um, iterate that, and mm -hmm. it, it's not only the acting police chief, the town manager was involved, town council was involved. Uh, the board has seen the policy, and we are we want to make sure that everybody understands that, regardless of who is sitting in the seat um, of the police chief, it's it's not just the police chief's decision. It really is. All right. Well, I would like to add that. something else, <laughs> which is that uh, before our state legislature now is an act called the Safe Communities Act, of which you, Jack, are co-sponsor. I understand. And if that's passed, it does the equivalent of making the whole state a sanctuary state. And I would definitely support that. Unfortunately, I believe the speaker is refusing to bring it before the legislature. And if it does pass, the governor has stated that he's going to veto it. I don't know if there are enough people to override a veto. But should that act pass, and I support that act, it would make the whole question of sanctuary communities locally moot. It, it would, but I'm going to jump in here and just say, please, uh, and, and if that happens, you know, I, I could do this to you. I hope that any financial impacts mm -hmm. are borne by the state and not passed on to local communities as an unfunded mandate. So I can say that as a legislature, you know, many of us thought that the November election was going to go differently than it did. And so now we are trying to respond as quickly as possible to an administration that wasn't what we were anticipating. And we're all receiving the same sort of calls you are as well, that people are afraid, and yeah. in many instances rightfully so. And so the Safe Communities Act does a whole host of things. but. The, the, crest of the crux of it is that it makes sure that our Massachusetts state tax dollars don't go to enforce federal um, immigration policy. However, uh, if we lose federal dollars, I think what Lori's getting to, if we lose federal dollars because of state status, we don't want it to trickle down and have all our Chapter 70 money and our Chapter 90 money and har have our municipalities decimated by that. I think these are all important conversations to have, knowing that they're happening while people are now afraid to stand at the bus stop with their kids. And so there's this immediate concern that's happening mm -hmm. where people aren't going to restaurants that they did yesterday. People are refusing to, or, you know, being afraid to go into their children's school. And so I think we need to take that all into consideration. I appreciate you all being as honest and uh, upfront with your answers on this question. And I know you all have connections with the local immigrant community. And whichever one of you, you know, the two of you that win, I hope you continue to develop those relationships uh, because no one of us can be experts on any one thing. And I think on this topic, I would urge us all to, to listen to the people that are, are most immediately affected. I would like to add just one thing. It, it, it's, it's affecting more than the immigrant community. Oh, of course. Um, the, especially in the schools, because kids are kids, and their friends are, are, are terrified. And they're living in very insecure environments. And that kind of tension does pass around. And when kids are afraid that their friends, something's going to happen to their friends, they're also very badly affected. And so it's not just the immigrant community that's being affected by this, it's our whole community. And I think we just all need to kind of take a deep breath and realize that whenever we're coming into contact with somebody in the street, we, we don't know what they're going through, regardless of what their status is. Everybody's got their own issues with this right now, and I think we all have to be more understanding of one another. Great, so I want to ask a question to all of you. Um, top priority, or what is the, the issue that you feel actually is most facing framing him at this moment? And, because we're limited on time, if we could limit it to, to one issue per person. Um, and why don't we go in reverse order? So Gwen, <laughs> if you wouldn't mind uh, taking a minute. Mm -hmm. One issue facing Framingham. Uh, I think uh, our probably our most pressing local issue, as opposed to all the global issues that we can also address here, is um, our, our town government being so unrepresentative of the whole community. It's concerned me for many years that uh, the way we run our current government, it takes a, so much time to, to participate that it, it excludes people who do not have that time available. And so it trends the Board of Selectmen, town meeting, it all trends much 
older, whiter, wealthier, and northern in the town than the town as a whole. And I feel that the people in the southern end are, are underrepresented and underengaged. So I would like to see a more representative form of government and, and also engaging people more from the neighborhoods. We currently have a system that everyone is elected at large, well, not the town meeting members, but the, the board of selectmen, and then their precincts, some of them meet, some of them don't. Whether we become a town or a city, I would like to see local neighborhood organizations. We talk about the village of Saxonville, the village of Knobscott, the downtown, that's almost it for what we consider active neighborhoods. And I would like to see precinct or ward or district-based neighborhood planning groups that can meet with their representatives and, and involve more citizens that way. Thank you. Lori? Sure. I, I'm not going to even jump there. I'm going to go in a completely different okay. direction. Um, uh, what I think is the most pressing issue and probably what would be my priority for the future is continued um, sustainability and affordability of Framingham. I think that we have our, our challenges down the road, our projects down the road are very large projects. And um, you know, in, in capital projects, from building schools, some of the you know the road issues, and, and municipal buildings. I think that we are in a really good financial position. I think we've had excellent financial management, um, but I think that we need to you know think long term, buckle down, and and really look at the budget. In a, in a very careful way and continue our approach, which has been to grow our economic base, but we have to do it very carefully, very thoughtfully. Um, we need to keep cognizant of our neighborhoods and make sure that they retain the character and the quality of life features that they are, you know, are so well known for. So I think um, continued affordability and sustainability with our services is, is huge. Thank you. I, the, the most important short-term um, problem or issue facing um, the taxpayers in Framingham is whether we become a city. And uh, I am running to educate the voters about how expensive this will be if we go with the city and how uh, taxes will rise as a result of that. And so um, I want to see the most informed voters um, make their, cast their ballot for or against the charter. Um, I'm battling misinformation about um, how um, framing the um, town meeting is broken or not rep represented it. Uh, in fact, we have more voices on town meeting when we keep the full complement of 162 than if we concentrate power and the budget in the hands of 12 individuals. On the long term, um, if we do defeat the charter, which I hope uh, we will, um, then I bring to um, the fore expertise in taxes, and I'm hoping that there'll be significant tax reform in Framingham, particularly as it regards uh, assessment of uh, residential property versus commercial property. Excellent. Thank you. Cheryl? Um, <clears throat> I have to say I am on this, the same fiscal bandwagon. I think the biggest challenge facing Framingham, short term and long term, is the sustainability of what we're doing. We have, uh, the last few years, we, because we went to the GIC for the insurance, the health insurance, and saved a great deal there, we were able to put those savings back in to the budget, keeping the tax rate at, uh, the tax increase at 1.25%. At and for two years, and then I think it was 1.75 last year that was voted on. I still voted for the 1.25 because I, I don't believe we should be increasing taxes as much as we have been. Long term, now the budget this year, they're looking, uh, the town manager and the CFO are proposing a 2.5% increase, which I don't support. I think if you look at where we've been and where we're going, it's completely unsustainable at 2.5% to continue as we've gone. I'm a strong supporter for schools. Um, I think we provide tremendous municipal services that you don't find in other communities. And I think we can still do that by doing it smarter. And one of the things that, that's been brought up um, in passing is our workforce. We have 50% of our, uh, about 50% of our townside workforce is within five years of retirement. And I think we need to start looking at, you know, 
in planning, when people retire, and looking at individual departments, and how can we do things differently and smarter and more efficiently within those departments so that we don't take that opportunity to not lay somebody off, but to still save a position. And those kinds of things need to take place in order for us to continue to provide the services, to continue to, to keep Framingham in an affordable place to live. I'm very concerned that we're going to tax senior citizens out of their home. We then end up with a family moving in. So let's say the average $6,600 for a tax bill. So we, we, we're receiving $6,600 in taxes. The senior citizen is not requiring that many services uh, compared to a family. And then a family moves in with two kids, and now we're looking at maybe $30,000 in educational expenses. And we've just lost by increasing taxes. Mm -hmm. We've ended up on the negative. Even though we've increased taxes, we've ended up losing resources. And putting more of a demand on the resources we have is, is probably a better way to put it. So I think we have to start thinking in terms of the cycle that we're building. I mean, we certainly want new families to move into Framingham, but we also want to make sure that we can sustain what we're doing. And Lori's point on capital is right on the money. We have been so derelict as a community for generations on upkeep and maintenance of our buildings and our roads that we do face some significant hurdles, not only in the municipal side, but on the school side. And we do have a, a building plan that has been done by a blue ribbon panel that really gives us a roadmap. But that roadmap also shows us where the costs are and what kind of expenditures are needed and what's going to be necessary. And I, I think it's up to the, the residents of Framingham to make their wishes known about what services are most important to them, what level they want those services at, and you know, what kinds of projects they support us doing. Because in the end, it's their money. And we're representing them. Not, it's not what I want. It's not what my neighborhood wants. It's what all of Framingham wants. Oh, did I just my neighbor's not going to be happy. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but it's, our, it's, our those are the people is, I represent. I appreciate that. So our time is actually drawing to a close. This has gone by quickly. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask a final question to each of you, and if you could try to keep your answer to a sentence or two. But what is it about Framingham that makes it the sort of place that you are happy to live in and advocate for? Why don't we start with Lori? Okay, um, well, that one's easy. Uh, Framingham is a strong, caring, vibrant community, and it is a remarkable collection of people who are active, involved, and you know don't sit back. They're not apathetic, and whether you agree with them or not 100% of the time or 20% of the time, it's wonderful to have that involvement. Um, we're a diverse geographical community. Each neighborhood is so amazing and different with different assets from historic buildings to open space. and um, it's just, what was my other thing? Oh, yeah. Sorry, um, you've already gone a couple. Oh, yeah, OK, sorry. four more things. <laughs> okay, and town employees okay. who are loyal and, and also work really hard. And it's just a great place to live. Perfect. Two sentences as compound, but two nonetheless. Cheryl? Um, I, will, I will second what Lori just said, <laughs> but I will emphasize it's the people for me. Uh, <laughs> we have, and it's the community people, the volunteers in this community who, who make government work, who make our civic organizations work, who make our churches work, who, who help our children after school. That spirit and that sense of community is something that is so special in Framingham. And that's something that makes me so proud to, to represent people here. Okay. Excellent. Gwen? Well, of course, many of the same things. I love the diversity, the, the recreational opportunities, the diversity of people, the diversity of landscape. Um, it's been a great place to raise my four children. And the schools have served us very well. And uh, and the location as far as, you know, we've got the, the tr commuter rail and we're two exits on the pike. It's so easy to get in and out of Boston. It's been a great place to live. And what I'm excited about now, I felt ever since I moved here almost 20 years ago that it wasn't quite, it wasn't living up to its potential. And especially the downtown could be such a vibrant urban center. And I do think that we are now very close to having the downtown yeah. that I would like to see, which yeah. is one of the things that I am really eager to work towards and support as a selectman. Excellent. Deborah, last word, 10 seconds. And I've been living here uh, for 55 years uh, on and off. And um, I see Framingham as a wonderful town with town values, with a market that we frequent, that we, um, we treat each other with respect, and we preserve our history of a uh, community, uh, one of the largest in the United States. 
and I hope we stay that way. Well, thank you, each of you, for joining me today on my inaugural show. Thank you to everyone at home watching. I hope you'll mark your calendars now for April 4th, where you'll have an opportunity to vote for two of these four candidates for the Board of Selectmen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. Thanks. 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 Awesome.